All right. Hey, man, I'm on. How are you? Good to All see right. you. All right. Yeah. Good to see you. I'm not at my office today. No. I'm in a dome at Grand Canyon University. I'm a waiting skip. for the Taco Bell to <laughs> open. Well, it's open, but I'm, I have a meeting. So I'm meeting here right now. So how are you? I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm actually at Wayland Baptist University. So, hey, we're, we're all doing pretty well. Uh. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, two different universities. Oh, man. Well, hey, so we're uh, in this. This is uh, our third part on worship. It kind of started with hymns and just turned into this. And um, so, man, why don't you tee us off today of where this conversation is yeah. going to head? I think it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, so um, my cameras, again, want not to focus today. Um, either that or maybe I'm just blurry. Uh, but <laughs> all good. you ever feel that way? No one's coming to look yeah. at our faces. That's the good news. By the way, I got my hymnal out just so that we have a hymnal in every one of these. Um, I have no <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> but we've been talking about a whole lot of different questions. Last time we talked about biblical bases for music and worship. And, and today we're going to look a little bit about that question of style. And generally, um, uh, maybe beyond that, what, what are the pieces that should be in worship, even beyond music? And uh, kind of maybe I was hoping we get into the question of, uh, regulative principle, normative principle stuff, which is a debate in worship that's been going on since the Reformation of um, how do we restrict or allow things into worship? And um, that'll make sense. Hang on, we'll get to it as we dump in, uh, jump yeah, in yeah. further. So, um, all right, well, you ready to just pray and then we'll go for it? Sure, man, let's do it. And you're, you're so dedicated, by the way. I'm just, I'm so excited to be here with you and Anywhere Excited. I will, op I will open up my laptop and we will fill. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. All right, let's pray. Um, the Lord's prayer. Uh, please join me. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, so look, right. I, I guess this discussion has sprung out of the fact that um, I, I mean, I guess we'll start it like this, right? In church, there is definitely stylistic issues that people uh, debate over. And so we've talked, to, I think we talked about one of the last times, talking about how, you know, churches have got people where we split our services, right? Because people are so adamant about the kind of style that they want. So you'll have traditional, contemporary, we have blended sometimes and uh, ends up being, in my opinion, the 90s uh, where you're just locked into there and nobody's happy. Um, you know, I, I've actually heard I've actually heard pastors say, yes, yeah, so we do blend it and nobody's happy. That's great. You know, <laughs> so I don't know if that's it's the lose lose. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's the necessarily the way to go. Um, <clears throat> but the question is, OK, so let's talk about it because I think sometimes what's leveled right is. There on some faces, people say, you know, worship is so boring if you just stick with the, the, the organ and the piano. And then, um, you know, the other side that grew up with, you know, more of a traditional hymn, uh, you know, uh, background uh, will complain. And one thing I've never understood is uh, frustration with drums, why, why drums are viewed as such a problem, electric guitars, things like that. But, but for the record, you, know, you are a drummer. Um, I, I am yeah. a drummer. And <laughs> I am, I call myself the third string drummer that if, if our guy can't make it, uh, put me in coach, I'll do it. But I'm, I, I, I'm like a last resort drummer that you need though. But yeah, I mean, so, so there, I mean, a lot of that comes down to, okay, so is there any theological issue with the instruments that we incorporate into worship, or is that more preferential as we talk about? So anything you want to start with that? Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, so this, this is a debate and, and this, again, um, digging backwards in time to try to figure out how did this become an issue? Uh, and was it always, was there any theology and biblical thinking going on here? Or was it just, I don't like that. Um, you know, this yeah. is go back into that 60s rock and, a, you know, a, a cultural fight, a generational fight between, you know, um, the World War II uh, era uh, adults and that uh, generation, the Woodstock generation, and, and all of that music is um, associated with long hair and a cultural revolution. Um, 
I think there, there's a deeper thing that can be um, plumbed here if we look through the history. But I think a lot of the emotion that's tied to it and the reason that we said, oh, you can't have drums because it wasn't something that was a normal part of worship until you ended up with electric instruments and mm -hmm. a larger drum. But, you know, you did have churches that had orchestration and things. And of course, you could always have the do, 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 you know, that that drum was OK. Yeah. Um, but um, when you start tying it to that uh, electric um, sound distortion, you know, uh, a lot of people would associate that with bands that kind of associated it with. Uh, evil uh, and uh, disorder, distortion, you know, it's not yeah. hard to connect that to the devil. It doesn't have to be made that way, though, but that's, I think, there's a lot of emotion in that whole era, and that isn't really dealing scripturally with it. Um, so I think we ought to deal scripturally with it, and again, drums, Old Testament, I think we have passages that are talking about, you know, do this on the on the, the symbols and uh, idea that there's drums. Yeah. Um, you know, some I watched a documentary that the Ark of the Covenant actually was a drum that they carried into battle, which I'm uh, not sure I, I buy into it, but it was an interesting idea. Well, you, you touch know. that thing and you get zapped. <laughs> so I don't know about that. I know? guess the priests were hitting it. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, it was God one of those. I would have liked that too much in the Old Testament specifically. The problem with that theory. I bet Uzo would have had a problem with that theory too. Yeah, maybe that's what you know. He wasn't he wasn't one of the priests, you know, yeah, exactly. and it wasn't being carried right. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, if it's on the History Channel, always always have a high degree of skepticism, um, unless it's uh, ancient aliens. Then it's all going to be good, you it's know. All so, terrible. Stuff. So, you know, so, I, before I go on the history um, road, you know, do you want me to go down this road right now, or do you want to jump back in and? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the big thing is, you know, we see instruments and we can talk more about that in a little bit about that. So we see different instruments. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't get why not only do we have fights in church about, you know, is that we don't need these instruments, things like that. And, and I'm painting with a broad brush here. I'm not saying any specific church that I know. Definitely. Um, that's not really, that's not like an issue in my church or all anything like that. But I've known of where yeah, like, why would we add these instruments and things like that? Um, you know, and so then, you know, of denominations, though, that will not do any instruments. And so you kind of get back into why, you know, what's the what's the issue? Why, um, you know, is there a theological reason of why they say we just do a choir? We don't have, you know, we don't have instruments. Um, and, uh, you know, is 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 there a right answer? necessarily too to kind of sift through that because just because the majority of churches in america today seem to be on the musical side and in drums and bands and stuff like that um does not necessarily uh necessitate that the you know majority rules in terms of uh what the right theological opinion is so yeah you know, what where are we at where does that division kind of come from yeah, so this is, again, I used the term earlier, the regulative principle of worship uh, is, is a term that you may or may not be familiar with, but that's, I know you are, uh, Dr. Pate, <laughs> but not, not everyone watching might know this. And what happened is if you go, you know, to the 1500s and you go to a church, you're going to see that it was almost all um, governed by a liturgy. And there were different types of liturgy after the Reformation, the Catholic Church kind of standardized the liturgy at the Council of Trent, and that liturgy was your order of worship, how it was to go. <clears throat> they unified things mostly into Latin in the West at that point in time. You still had your Byzantine worship, which was mostly still in Greek, but that goes back to Chrysostom. And you, you have this very highly structured worship service. And the reformers, especially Martin Luther, really thought that one of the most important things in worship is congregational singing. And he wanted to try to uh, kind of do things a little differently than that strict liturgical structure. And so in the Reformation, as a product of the Reformation, when we broke with these really tight rules for liturgy, which if you grew up Anglican or you've visited an Anglican church or a Lutheran church, less Lutheran, sorry, more Anglican, Catholic, uh, Orthodox, if you go to those churches, it's going to be very stylistic. Um, this is what we do every week. And in Protestant churches, it's looser. But the Protestant tradition recognized that if we break from liturgy, what are the constraints that we would place upon our worship so that it doesn't get out of hand? And so the regulative principle, I've actually got um, the Second London Confession of Faith here, which I know everybody keeps one in their pocket. Well, uh, you know, so it's so current that uh, it's, <laughs> it's, that's why I don't have my copy, right? Right, it's, right. It's not made it to me yet. 
When is the London Confession? That's 1600s, correct? This is 1689. So this is the this would be that um, Baptist Confession. The Reformed Baptist tradition is probably the gold standard for Reformed Baptists today, which I would love to count myself one, which I'm not fully there yet, but nevertheless, uh, great thinkers in that in that group. Mm. Um, and maybe I'll get there someday. Lord's just got to move me on some things, and you know, if He's chosen me, I know He will. Oh my! Um, <laughs> we'll get you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm open to it. Let it happen. Um, but here's, uh, here's what it says. The light of nature shows that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is just good and doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and all the soul and with all the might. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself, and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representations or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. And so that confession, again, is also tied to the Westminster. The, the 1689 um, confession and the Westminster are very much uh, very similar. It's just one's Baptist in its view of baptism. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few slight differences as well. But um, Nevertheless, that is the regulative principle. Basically, God is the one who gives the rules for worship, and you cannot worship God beyond what he has given yeah. um, or counter to what he has given. And of course, there's a little snippet here about under visible representations. And so this would also be um, kind of a, a jab at uh, visible representations of Jesus, even in the worship service. The icons. Yeah. yeah. But you can also have, you know, Jesus carrying the lamb, you know, in the hallway. That's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, th that's big questions that, that happen. Um, so anyway, this is dated a little bit, but there's a lot of this that I would say is correct. And it would go back again. We talked earlier uh, today, we were talking about um, the Ark of the Covenant and, uh, you know, God gave rules for how to move the Ark, mm -hmm. you know, and so you can't just stick it on a cart. You know, this, this is not acceptable to God. And so did God give rules for worship? And so this is what the Protestants were thinking because they had detached from the liturgy. And these liturgical books go back hundreds of years, thousands of years. And so it, it had developed into a very systematic way of worshiping God. And so when you break from that and you have more of a free worship, how do you, um, one, defend yourself against accusations from the Catholic Church and others that you all are just without any standards? Yeah. Um, and then also um, defense from today, because if you go to some worship services today, it's a free for all and it may be something that is not honoring to God. And even, you know, the suggestions of Satan, um, the imaginations of men. How often yeah. have you, you know, <laughs> how many times have you been in a group and we we're trying, we got to do something to kind of liven this thing up. Like, what could we do? And you get your brain going, I know we'll play Jeopardy. Um, We'll do the love uh, connection and we'll, we'll have, um, you know, it's a Valentine's Day weekend. We'll have three couples come up and we'll see who knows each other the best. It'll be a great worship service. You know, it starts to make you think, well, is that really worship or am, yeah. I, doing, am I doing something else? Yeah, well, that's a great question to begin with. Yeah, because it does seem like you look at the spectrum today and it's kind of an anything and everything goes kind of mentality. And so I guess if I'm going to start to kind of navigate these waters, um, maybe, maybe we can start with saying, what do we know that like, um, that are elements that we think are ones that you can say for sure are allowed, right? Because those are the easier ones. And, and, but that comes back to the normative versus regulative, right? So I do think that I don't think you should, this is just where I land. Uh, I don't think you should limit your, we should not limit our view of what worship should include uh, to just the New Testament. We have a full canon of scripture, and I think it's important to recognize that when the temple was being set up, there were patterns for what was set out, and there were things that for you and I, we should recognize. So it's like, uh, you know, when you look at David uh, in First Chronicles 6, it says these are the men that David put in charge of music in the Lord's temple, and they ministered in song in front of the tabernacle, in front of the tent of meeting, uh, and so he gave these people like jobs. So music needs to be there. Um, and then what you find out though, is when you go through the Psalters and you find out all the instruments, right? So you'll begin to see like what you said, you'll see symbols. Uh, you know, the, you know, sometimes there's the question of what is um, now the, the problem with some of these, by the way, if you look at these, um, these 
you know, uh, subtitles in the Psalms is some of these, we just don't know what they are, right? We know that they're using instruments in worship at the temple, but we're not sure. Like, for instance, like what is a gittith? That's Psalm chapter eight. And you kind of think, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, speculation of something like a gittith is uh, some sort of a eight stringed instruments that maybe came from Gath, um, you know, and so when David spent time in Philistia, did he pick up, you know, some of those instruments? Is that something that was maybe common, right? But you look and you'll see uh, like different things like that throughout the Psalter that would make me kind of think that, you know, that this is something that we're supposed to do. If you look at Psalm 150, Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn, with a harp and a lyre, tambourine and dance, strings and flute, resounding cymbals, clashing cymbals, right? Uh, as a Baptist, you're like, I agree with every one of those, except that dance part, right? And you're like, well, so maybe that's a question of dance and where does dance? Uh, because you know, if you've been to some church services, you do, there's a, there's a dance piece and sometimes that might be a little distracting. So what about that? So I mean, that's my initial just jump into this is I think we need to look at both. And so in terms of music, um, I just can't get past the fact that God had ordained and allowed for this as acceptable worship in his temple. But yet when it would come to his church would say, I don't want any of that anymore. So what are you thinking? Yeah. And I think that that's a really good point. And, um, you know, but uh but but drawing from this and, and again it's it's like anything else if you say well i believe in the regulative principle of worship you still have to then interpret what does that mean because we have passages that you're saying so church of christ historically would say well the new testament doesn't mention instruments in worship therefore we're not going to have instruments in our worship but singing is all over the new testament and and so that's the way that we'll do it um i don't know i've never been accused of sinning necessarily for having instruments but maybe you know in some of the more um uh, difficult times between denominations, there, there were some name calling uh, issues going on there. But uh -huh. um, what that denomination was trying to do is take carefully the, the instructions that God gave. And they were overly uh, maybe uh, restrictive in my mind, following that principle. Um, the other, uh, you know, that you'll have groups that will say, well, you know, instruments, I think, came from the line of Cain, right? Uh, so that means that they must be evil. <laughs> mm. um, I've never heard that. That's a very interesting insight, right? The instrument making from Cain's line. I've never brought those and saw those. You're just, an old, I'm right, right? That's there, isn't it? That's, yeah, the, the, essentially, once you get into the Cain story, you, you, civilization explodes is what that is. And, and, you know, shepherding was also part of that as well. So <laughs> let's, um, <laughs> and cities, you know, so there's a lot no. there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, so, so again, you can kind of see people were seriously wrestling with these things and some were again, the better safe than sorry approach. Um, and again, I think there's also a recognition that, um, when we moved into this electrical instrument era, that, that was a major, uh, a problem for many, but, um, there was also this idea that church music should always have a certain sound to it. It should be beautiful. And, and so all of that kind of is playing into this. I'm not really tied to the regulative principle overly, but I think it's important to recognize that um, maybe I ought to be. I, I haven't wrestled with it as much as I, I should, uh, but there's just a lot in scripture that opens the door pretty wide to different things in worship. And so even if you follow the regulative principle, there, there, there's a loose version of that. Yeah. Um, that, like you said, you found a verse on dancing. David dances before the Lord. So if, if you have a group that's doing interpretive dance, um, that might be fitting, you know, but it would have to be constrained by modesty and the other things that we find in scripture. Exactly. And so, and it has to be um, elevating to God, not elevating to self. Um, and I would say the same thing about special music. You know, uh, I grew up in the church where every teenage girl uh, that had a voice was going to have a special music opportunity. And then there was always a discussion about who's going to tell that young lady that uh, she needs to cover up a little bit because she's uh, you know, preparing for American Idol or Dancing with the Stars, and that doesn't have a good place for yeah. uh, worship. <laughs> and and then you get into that dress code uh, fight. Well, well, who are you, and and whose fault? To, maybe the young men need to get control of their own imaginations, and you get you get that back and forth. 
all well, of that that's again. A, that's a whole nother discussion going on on the Twitter sphere today <laughs> with uh, like some of those, uh, some of these people right now. So that's another conversation for sure. But I mean, I tell you that too, like, I mean, so then, and then what constitutes, I think at some point we have to say, well, then what constitutes a song? Because I've been at churches where they've had the special music and they've sung Jesus take the wheel, right? I'm glad yeah. Jesus is mentioned, but uh, is that an appropriate worship song? Um, no, I don't think so. Or God bless the broken road by Rascal Flats, like three wooden crosses, man. That's hey, man, now, hey, don't you're meddling. Three wooden, hey. three wooden crosses is is a good one. It always it, brings you to tears. It, but I mean, so I think you're right. I think there needs to be some sort. I think regulative principle is good to say, you know, look at kind of the boundaries of this. But yeah, I think. There's a lot there in scripture that we should say there's freedom in that too. I think you look at it and see how God has allowed for and used worship. There is some freedom in what we should be open to. You know, it's interesting on the organ, uh, by the way, because it, for the longest time, it was kind of like, you know, especially in traditional churches, um, piano, organ, that's it, right? That's all you need. And I was always wondering like the organ piece and thought like, when, when was this ever... Like, how long has this been around? And when was this ever viewed as, like, exciting music for the culture? And, and you know what I found out as I was watching uh, old episodes of Mickey Mouse with my kids one day. They're celebrating Mickey Mouse's birthday. I believe it was Mickey's birthday. And one of the presents was a big organ. And it was like the happening party. <laughs> they were all playing organ together. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you'll see evidence of that. Like, even if you look at the Snow White time, Snow like, White. Yeah. that organ oh. <laughs> was a big, powerful, you know, musical machine. And so, you know, that's once again reveals to me is like, that's not like a sanctified, set apart instrument for worship. Uh, just as somebody who's just, like I said, my limited, you know, cultural observation, that was the instrument of choice, it seems, for many for a very stylistic time and era. And so, um, you know, so like even moving to more electronic sounding stuff today, okay, if that's where we're at style wise, um, then I don't really have a problem with that. I'm not so much hung up on that um, because even, even in the scriptures, we don't really know style. We just know that there seems to be, there's some big loud instruments uh, that they were using and, um, and things seem to be kind of exciting as they were going through and, and leading the people in worship. Yeah. And I think that that's, again, we, we have to make sure that are we working from scripture to inform worship? Or are we, or are we dealing in an emotional uh, plane? Because there was a time that the, the organ um, could have been criticized as being something very um, dangerous and, you know, youthful and, you know, a cause for dancing. And, and we know where that leads, that kind of stuff. <laughs> And then, of course, it, if it's an organ, it needs to be a pipe organ, not an electric organ, because uh, God approves wind instruments, you know, th that kind of stuff. You yeah. get into those arguments that are just, um, they sound a little ridiculous today, but, you know, they're trying to make an argument. But I think what was motivating, motivating those arguments was, uh, I don't like this music. I need to find something to shut it down rather than, you know, trying to truthfully work through it. Um, what are the things that I've looked at, too? Um, I, there's a listening to a, he's a Catholic guy named Scott Hahn, and, and he'd written a book that was really helpful in, in helping me to see revelation in a, in a different light. Uh, and the ideas that he brought up is that there was an invitation for John on the Lord's day to a heavenly worship service. And so John was isolated on Patmos. And so God brings him up into the heavenly worship. And what do you see in God's worship in the book of revelation? Well, you see incense, you see prayer, uh, you see proclamation and, and the reading of God's word or the scroll that's opening. And, and so it's an interesting I, uh, idea. And it's, it's kind of a defense of the liturgical pattern, yeah. which I, I don't have a problem with. Uh, again, it lets you see that there's a tremendous amount of freedom if you're, if you're willing to look at scripture. And of course, uh, if God is willing, there's also kneeling and bowing before God, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, these are, are good things. And I, I think when you really say, if we're going to restrain it by scripture, that's good. But if we're going to take the whole of scripture, we've got a lot of room. Yeah. Uh, but then there are some things. Should we have drama in, in, in church service? You know, uh, you look at the ancients and they viewed drama as a really uh, dangerous medium, uh, yeah. especially because all of the pagans were using it to promote all kinds of terrible things. Uh, but I know a lot of churches, you know, we got to have some drama. It really helps open the message. And it's a creative way of doing that. Um, I don't really have a problem with drama. 
but again, the drama needs to be in conformity. We got to have a clear message. It's not a place to be uh, really controversial and try to, you know, poke the bear and get people all uh, worked up before the message. You know, th these tricks that we use are, are some things that we need to be careful about. And maybe the drama shouldn't be part of the worship, but we can do some other things as a church together and celebrate. Yeah. So, you know, these are really important questions that should be asked. But I would say this, I think most um, worship leaders are, are too busy on their craft to think through the theological issues. Mm -hmm. And so I, I need to practice that song. You know, nobody's ever questioned whether I should do that song. It's the new song by so-and-so, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, we just need to master it and get it into worship so that we'll be ahead of, you know, Second Baptist or, or whatever uh, church down the street has got the cutting edge band. And those are, in my mind, lesser issues. But when you, we get into this competition mode and, and uh, entertainment driven worship, uh, then, then I think we have a problem. And I, and I think that that's where the regulative principle is helpful because we will move to greater and greater extremes in order to draw a crowd. Yeah. No, I think, um, I mean, I really feel like this conversation where we're headed right now is, is kind of two different places that two roads that we need to go down, right? Is, is one of them is, okay, so what are the basic, most basic elements that we need in a worship service to call it worship? um for us you know when we gather together and then the other one is what are some elements that we see uh you know maybe for what would qualify as a worship song or maybe something that maybe some guidelines for having to sift through you know what what do we choose to sing uh right because we do know that some say we only sing the psalms right okay well we've kind of dealt with that already but but what, what might be some criteria that we would use to help us so that we're, I think, I think you're right that a worship leader and a pastor, we should be very aware of the kind of songs that we sing and we shouldn't too. And yet yeah, I'm guilty of this. There are many, there, have, there has been a few times in my life where I'm up there saying, man, I don't know if that's a song I would want to sing again. Right. And I let that one <clears throat> slip. I didn't give guidance on that. Or I was afraid to, you know, were you afraid to rock the boat? Because everybody loves that song so much that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be seen as the stick in the mud because you have a theological hang up with it. So um, those are those are, I think, two roads that we could we need to probably venture down. Which road do you want to take? Well, I, I think, you know, we we have kind of a loose <laughs> show here, so we kind of uh, roll with it. So I, I think um, it doesn't matter much to me, but um, yeah, I think that we're, we're developing it. So uh, you, you go ahead and choose. Look, I'm going to drink my so, Coke. All right, so as I think through this, right, I think that, um, you know, I think an easier discussion to have currently is what are elements that are needed in a worship service, right? Like what are things <clears> that we that we know should be happening. But what happens with that, by the way, is, um, is kind of becomes much broader almost to then, is it all about the day that we gather versus is it about what the church is doing as a whole, right? So uh, let's, let's go down this road because I do think there's some specific things that we should say, have I had church today if... I have done these things, right? Can you call this church if this was not present uh, in, in that service today? So, um, you know, so I don't know, man, I, as, as I read, I, I think some, a good maybe starting point for that conversation is, right? Like, you know, you do you recognize in the early church, there were some elements of what the church was doing that the church should do. So, yes. you know, that they were, you know, that they were hearing the teaching of the apostles, uh, they were gathered, fellowship, breaking of bread, whether that's a reference to the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> or whether that's just that they were fellowshipping fellowship. and eating together, and then to prayer. So like, those are most basic kind of building blocks, right, of, of something that would happen uh, in a service. Uh, what else do you add to that list? Yeah, so, you know, and, and what's nice about um, the confessions of faith, even the Baptist faith and message is that there's Bible verses attached. And so some of these verses came out of that 1689 confession 
Um, First Timothy 4.13, I think is paramount. Uh, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Uh, So in my mind, that means teaching, preaching of the word of God is paramount in a worship service. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and if you mimic the synagogue worship, there usually were reading from two or three passages of scripture, that, that scripture was always part of that. And if we don't have the scripture in our worship, I'm not so sure that we did. Um, you know, carrying on into 2 Timothy 4, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And that might be part of the regular pastoral practice, but in my mind, that, that has to be part of worship. Um, and so, and again, um, we, it all kind of ties together, but you brought up last time, you know, who's it for? Is it for the believer or the unbeliever? Yeah, and I think yeah. uh, primarily it's, it's worship of God, and that is for, for those that know him. And it will, by nature, also have uh, an influence on those that, that witness it. And so it, it stretches to the unbeliever, but genuine worship can only be done by believers. So I think the worship service has to be for believers. And then if someone pops in and gets saved, that's awesome. Um, and I think they will. Uh, but I think it'll be more powerful if we actually are truly worshiping God uh, than if we try to stylize everything to, to make a message for your atheist friend. Um, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with reaching your atheist friend, but I, I worship the corporate gathering of Christians is for the believers to worship their God. Yeah, I agree um, for that for sure. So, um, and I bring that up because I think, you know, and I like Andy Stanley sometimes, um, <laughs> but I, he was telling me sometimes when he put together his services, it's very much targeting uh, towards unbelievers. And so that he, he, he mentioned in one of the messages I heard that he, they take a worship service and they extend it out over maybe a month. And so on one week, you might have the, the music uh, instead of music every week, you might just do it one week. And then the following week, we might do the sermon intro where I don't get into the word so much, but I'm setting up the major questions that we're looking at. And so maybe by week three or four, we get into the word of God. And so I might um, have an atheist friend who we might not even sing Christian songs that first Sunday that they're there. And uh, we're going to build in some comfort. And by the, the third or fourth week, we've got to the word of God. And that sounded really strategic and helpful. And, and maybe it's a good way of reaching the lost. But you didn't, in my mind, have church if you didn't sing any Christian songs and you didn't open in the word of God in that first week, you didn't worship the Lord. What you did is you had a great seminar that was designed to reach the lost. Yeah. Um, but that's in my mind, that's not the Lord's day work, you know, maybe do that on a different day uh, and set up a seminar, yeah. but because we can't get our own people to come a different day of the week, we have to take the worship service, the day of the Lord and use it for other things. And, and this is, by the way, just throwing it out there. Hey, we're not going to have church this Sunday. What we want you all to do is go volunteer and do wonderful things in your community, and let that be your act of worship today. Um, no, <laughs> yeah. that, that's not biblical. That that is um, that again. Let's do that. Let's do it on Tuesday. Let's do it on Saturday. Yeah. But on the day we set aside for worship, we need to be about worship. Or and do so- it after church. You know, <laughs> uh, I know it makes for a long day, but y- you need to. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, you know, I would agree. I think that I, I think more and more I've been convinced that church is for is is for the believer in worship of the lord and that i think we've gotten it wrong when we've gone this consumer mentality seeker church thing and i know that was a big deal and you know we we you and i both were in time when that was a huge thing just kind of starting out where everything's tailored for that um but at the end of the day i feel like what that did is you 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 jettison so many important pieces for your church um, that uh, you watered everything down as a result of, uh, of instead of feeding your sheep, uh, you did barely any of that. I mean, the problem with a lot of that stuff is even though they would claim that they're, they're you know, uh, focusing on the teachings, right? The reality is uh, there would, you know, the, the exhortation and the teaching is not the kind of that that Timothy is being told to have is not the kind of teaching that you would see in a lot of churches today, which is, you know, here's five, five points to have a happy life. And I've strung five verses from all over the scriptures to give you a teaching like, no, you're not actually dealing with the text of the scriptures. You're not actually dealing with who God is. Uh, You're not dealing of, you know, how we all need to respond to this. You're, you're kind of limiting what I can pull from here and here and give you something 
And so I think that the, that definition of teaching even that is thrown in um, uh, that churches would claim that they're teaching uh, is, uh, is hardly uh, what, what is meant in that. I was at a church one time, a prominent church in uh, the Nashville area one time with a friend. It was probably about 11 years ago. And we were sitting there and whoever was speaking that day, we noticed we're sitting in church and uh, they had the songs and stuff like that. And the preacher is up there and, you know, he, he, um, 15 minutes in, he's been speaking poetry. He read like one verse and we haven't talked about the Bible since. And I just got frustrated and I left because to me, I felt like what a waste of time because I feel like, you know, you need to actually open the Bible and read it and teach it to your people. Otherwise you're wasting your time. And once again, I would say you've not really done worship. You've had worship music, but you've not spent time really digging into the word and, uh, and teaching your people. I, I think a poetry reading uh, is, is, is not a, uh, not a, a good supplement. I, I'll say this. I know in seminary, uh, that that was a uh, happening thing that certain churches in the area were training their people to say, if you want to know what it means to be, be a, you know, go here and learn how to do, go to these poetry reading houses. Um, that's not really going to help me, right? Mm -hmm. I, I need to be trained in how do I take a text and, and explain it to the people and not stick with my limited, you know, knowledge. I think one of the things I've loved about preaching exegetically, and this is for another time, I guess, too, is, is, how every week I'm learning, right? Like every work week I'm being stretched and changed, even myself. I'm not pulling from my, my knowledge, you know, even though I bring that into some of the prep. At the end of the day, I'm learning stuff I never knew um, that, you know, that, and it's, it's been important. It's been stuff I think that the pastor needs to be growing with the word as he's hearing it too, and not just shoveling what leftover pieces he's got and throwing it out to the congregation. So, I don't know that that's part of what I think about with yep. this whole seeker thing too, is, you know, you, you, you get rid of, you get popular music. It's not really deep, which a lot of this, you don't really talk about the deep things of scriptures. You don't really read much scripture. Um, and then you give a, a nice, you know, Ted talk essentially uh, about, you know, Christian living maybe. Uh, and that's about it. Yeah. Godly principles that will work anywhere <clears throat> and call no one, to real life change, you know, yeah. uh, which again, if you're a young up and coming white collar uh, business person, uh, that's really attractive. Um, and uh, I listen to those people outside of church, right? Uh, but that's not worship, right? And and it's a, <clears throat> it's, it's designed to attract certain people. And again, to build maybe a ministry. Uh, but, you know, sometimes when you're preaching the word, the last thing you want to preach is a difficult passage. Yeah, that is going to offend. And, you know, that's why expository exegetical preaching is important so that you, you, you get you get to that pass and you're like, well, I can't dodge it because that's where, you know, I prayed and God was directing us this way. We're going to go for it. The other thing I think that's really important is prayer. And the truth is, I think that that preaching, teaching the word of God and prayer uh, music is in the middle of that because music should be doing one of those things. Mm hmm. And so, you know, I, um, Matthew uh, 21, 13 is one of these verses. Um, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And I think another gospel that retells the same story, uh, house of prayer for the nations. And so this is a, a, a essential part of worship. I think a lot of worship music is supposed to be us praying these lyrics to God mm -hmm. or reciting them to ourselves and letting God's spirit speak to us through the lyrics. It's, it's one you know, it's a conversation yeah. that we're having and, um, <clears throat> and it's a corporate public conversation. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, prayer needs to be in the mix. And in my mind that, that goes confessional, um, Lord, forgive me prayers, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, James would also bring us here. If someone's sick among you, let him, um, confess our sins and the elders anoint with oil. And, uh, that person might, uh, will, will be healed is what it says. And I think they'll be healed spiritually and sometimes physically, uh, but confession of sin is part of that. And I think that's prayer and then intercession for the nations. Uh, so we, we are praying for others yeah. uh, that they might know Christ. And so, um, and again, music can be a tool to emphasize both of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's a great tool. Um, 
it, that uh, when I tell my people, well, respond, respond and use this time as you're hearing music to, to respond to the Lord. But also, I said, when you've, you've lost all that you can pray for, just begin to read them, read them and think about what that actually teaches you. So one thing it brings up, and I don't think we could do it now because I think we're at the end of our time, right? Is, um, so how about this one? Connected to worship music, altar call. Is an altar call an essential element, you know, to, to the worship? Because I would say that's one, if you want to talk about an element that's connected to your music, connected to the worship service, that you will get a lot of pushback on is, uh, is the use of an altar call. And is it an essential piece? Um, I, I mean, I think that's another one to jump. Like that's like, that's like part four is another part of that is, is, is dealing with some of that. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but that's one yeah, that no, we're I, talking, I think, I think that's a big thing. We, we should go there because, you know, sinner's prayer, invitation, altar call, uh, response time, you know, and all those things can be slightly nuanced or different. But yeah, I think we ought to take some time and, and work through that because I'm an advocate of something like that yeah um, but uh and i think it i think something some kind of response is is something that should be we, we should lead our people in in that like if you've heard from the lord now what what, what are you going to do um but yeah let's let's go through that maybe next time i think that would be great I and think, of course yeah should we use music in that altar call are we manipulating the mood are we trying to force you know um that's a big one it. man keep playing the song <laughs> someone's gonna come you know and you play the right one. I'll tell you what. I mean, that's a big one I want to talk about because, okay, let's, so we talk about our Sunday services, but what about when you have worship services outside the, the, the church, right? So when you do a worship like camps, right? Because talk about camp and they have what's called cry night. And that's the big night. That's the one that you go for the, you go for the, the response and the music there is killer that night. And it's all meant to to bring you to cry and to make it so i mean let's let's deal with that because that all this is tied together i think to the use of music manipulation everything that comes with it um so man there's this is just endless i feel like every time i feel like we're about to put this one away it's like okay well let's shelve it and we'll put it in another can and do another one for next time yeah well and i, I immediately am thinking okay uh lord's supper should it be every week yeah, uh, our baptism's part of the worship. It's an ordinance, um, you know. Or should we do baptism after or a different place or at the pool? Um, you know, the, all all these things uh, play in. And I, again, I think there's tremendous freedom. There really is. But um, how do we best utilize some of these things? And here's another crazy one: Should a marriage be a worship service? Um, in that sense, that it's a revealing a great mystery. Yeah. Um, you know, so so all these kind of things that I go through the mind. But yeah, I, I think. Uh, Probably we're out of time for today. There ain't no way we're going to tackle all of that. We're just got to cut it short, be <laughs> done with it now until next week. And um, we'll, we'll hit some of these topics. I think it'll be fun to, to keep going because now the wheels are spinning. And uh, it's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, how about this too? I mean, you just throw it out. Painting. Should you paint your service? Should you dance? Your, I mean, those are all elements of like, okay, well, okay, what, what's the... What's the principle there? And there might be some principle when you start talking about, especially when you get to Corinthians, man, about what about, what about less? I mean, we probably need to deal with too in Corinthians. Like where, what is the, what was happening when they said prophecy? What were they happening? We're talking about tongues. And, and he, he put some big, you know, guardrails for how those are supposed to be used. So if we're going to talk about Lord's Supper, we got to talk about those other pieces too. Yeah, the gifts. And then if you want to know about head coverings, that's a video that's already been done. So we can deal with dress code already in a separate video you can see that um andrew will probably be diligent to put that in his, <laughs> links, his video well yeah, yeah and we could do dress code too That's um right. yeah so but hey if you've got something that you're like what about this in worship that we haven't mentioned leave a comment because we like to read those comments and maybe that would help direct us we don't get tons of comments so you'll get special attention if you leave us a comment That's i only right. got 600 last week that's yeah. right <laughs> That's right we sift through every Every 600 comments we get, <laughs> I usually, I love the thumbs ups, but I would like, Hey, keep it going. So, and please Bye. share it with your friends. All yes, right. Sure. You want to close this out? Dr. Pate. Let's ben. do it, man. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen. This is fun, man. Thanks for doing it with me until again, I'll see you next week and we'll, Get at it again. Take care.
Bye-bye.